Um, <laughs> oh, come on. Okay, good. Uh, all right, guys, this is uh, video number 26. Uh, and I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite videos, I think, or at least one of my favorite topics. We get to, to actually use a, a theorem, Cochrane's theorem, which I think is really cool. Um, and also something I had to review a long, long, long time before uh, presenting this lecture. So, um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do first of all is is kind of uh, think about some concepts from video number twenty five, and uh, I think even video twenty four, where we looked at prediction intervals for certain values of x. So, what I want to do is I want to get out. Uh, and go to R. And I want to remind you of uh, something that, uh, you know, R has certain data sets that are built into it. And one is called mass. And uh, so I just, just got it. And uh, what I can do now is I can actually go data uh, parentheses and put nothing there. And you can see that I have different data sets here. And I know I've illustrated this to you before. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go down to, to mass and look at some that are there that I may want to pull up and, and uh, uh, demonstrate a simple linear regression. I don't know. That looks kind of cool right here. Uh, car is 83. No, car is 93. Uh, wow. Looks like they could have got, gotten something a little more up to date. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Let's, let's use it. So let's go cars 93 uh, to open it up. You know, no warning message, so that's good. Uh, what we can now do is do names cars 93 and look at the names of the variables that are included. And we got manufacturer, model, type, drivetrain, rear seat room, luggage room, so on and so forth. Now you can imagine, or at least I can imagine, uh, you know, in a multiple regression setting where we're using multiple predictors, coming up with some pretty cool stuff here. For example, you know, to be able to determine maybe or predict the miles per gallon for the highway. Well, we could use all kinds of different information here to make those predictions. Now, uh, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to get an error. But uh, so if I go mean, for example, uh, price. And notice I don't get an error because... I'm sorry, notice I do get an error. It's not finding the mean because we haven't attached the data set yet. So guys, I have to go attach and I have to go cars 93. And again, no error, so, so that's good. So now if I go mean price, we can see that the uh, mean price, I'm sure in, thou uh, in thousands of dollars is 19.51. Remember from many moons ago, we could just go standard deviation of price. And, oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Well, I forgot the, uh, I thought it was STDEV. Oh, well, well, I've, for some reason, all. Oh. No. Well, anyway, I've forgotten the, uh, the prompt for standard deviation. There we go. So SD. Uh, I think it's STDEV. Isn't that in Excel, maybe? I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. Um, it's something that you know, we can always, always kind of figure out. So, uh, you know, what I may want to do, at, do first of all is just go data frame. And uh, go cars 93. And what it's going to do, it's going to give me some information here. Um, in fact, it's going to be a lot of information. Let me see if I can get this stabilized here. And uh, notice I've got some categorical data, uh, which eventually we'll learn how to uh, do categorical data in a, a multiple regression model. We got to create something called dummy variables, which uh, is kind of unique. But also notice that we've got some quantitative data here that we could clearly evaluate in terms of a simple linear regression model. And you know what? I think I'll do that. What I'd like to kind of investigate here is the, uh, 
the city miles per gallon in the uh, the the um, uh, highway miles per gallon. So uh, let's let's see exactly how those variables are given. So uh, so we have MPG dot city. Notice MPG is all capitalized, and we have MPG highway. So I don't know. That seems like it might be something kind of interesting to um, uh, to 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 use to predict. We're all concerned about fuel efficiency, or we should be. I mean, I get about twenty-eight and a half miles per gallon on my car, and I'm actually uh, you know pretty happy with that. So. Uh, now, guys, first thing we want to do uh, uh, is, is, is probably just, just look at our models here. So, again, we have MPG uh, Highway that uh, ah. guys, I'm talking. I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. So we want to do a linear model uh, for MPG. Let's just uh, let's predict highway miles per gallon from miles per gallon in the city. And we can just do model and you can see that we get our coefficients for our model. So these, these would be the estimates obviously of beta one and beta zero. So it looks like in terms of our miles per gallon for the city that uh, for about uh, each additional miles per gallon you get in the city, you're gonna be predicting about 0.9 miles per gallon for the highway. Um, Dogs are going crazy again. What about that? Now we can get <laughs> we can get some more information by going AOV model, and here we get uh, some of squares and the degrees of freedom, which you know after the <clears throat> previous lecture uh, should make a little bit more sense. And hopefully this residual standard error down here makes more sense considering the previous. Um, previous videos. Now the next thing I may want to do is I may want to go summary uh, of my model and when I do that I get uh, <clears throat> a lot more information just based on the coefficients. Now you might say well yeah yeah but you get some more stuff down here and you do you get your uh, these R squareds that we'll talk about actually in the next video and we get our F statistic and our degrees of freedom and um, so, you know, we have a highly statistically significant model here. Now, something I want you to point out, I want to point out to you is notice that this probability, this p-value for miles per gallon, turns out to be exactly the p-value for our F statistic. That's going to be true for a while. As long as we stay in a simple linear regression model where we have one predictor, uh, <clears throat> that's going to be true. So, again, by the end of this video, there's going to, well, we're going to get into the p-value for the f-statistic in um, a lot more detail, okay? But what I'd ultimately want to uh, want you to take a look at here is I'd want you to take a look at the ANOVA for the linear model uh, for model. Now, what this is going to give us is it's going to give us our sum squares, so it partitions out the sum of squares. Now, notice it doesn't give the sum of squares total. It doesn't give the mean square total, which is not a big deal. Because guys, remember, the mean square total, I'm sorry, the mean square is not additive. So we couldn't add these two values and get anything of value. But it would really be nice for our degrees of freedom and our sum of squares for both the model, which it calls MPG city, and the error, which it calls residuals. These degrees of freedom here, the total degrees of freedom would be 92 because it's uh, additive. And the degrees of freedom for the sum, I'm, I'm sorry, the sum of squares for the total would be the sum of 2330.28 plus 285.03. Because again, the sum of squares uh, are um, additive. But again, guys, the mean square uh, is not additive. So the if we did include the total here, this would be left blank. Uh, under the mean square because again they're not additive. So uh, now something we talked about uh, a little while ago uh, was how to predict and if we're just going to focus in on one particular miles per gallon 
And just for the heck of it, let's say that we want to predict for 25. Now, we know that we can put that in our model and get an estimate of the mean. But we know because of sampling variation and the underlying probability model that we're going to get a variation from cars with, for example, miles per gallon equal 25. We don't expect every single car with miles per gallon 25 in the city to get the same miles per gallon for the highway. Well, the way, the way we can do that uh, is we can actually, uh, let's see, what I would probably do here is, uh, I'll tell you what, let me try this. <laughs> Put up here. This is a trial. Okay. I don't I don't know if this is going to work or not. So we call it our model model. And if I do MPG city equal, just for example, 25. And then I can do an interval here. We'll predict. Let's see if that works what I've got. Okay, that's a bunch of gobbledygook that I don't want. All right, here's what I'm here's what I'm going to have to do. Um, I'm going to have to set this up. So, so let's go predict twenty five. And I'm going to have to do data frame. Um, <clears throat> MPG city equals 25. So now I can run um, a predict for my model which is you know, what I called my linear model. Predict 25. And then do interval equal predict. Yeah, OK, perfect. All right, so this is what I want. And notice what, uh, what this gives me is my fit. So if I put uh, 25 uh, in my model, so in other words, I have a, a city miles per gallon, 25. Uh, our model will predict about 31 miles per gallon in the city. But, but because, again, this varies from car to car, we create the 95% confidence interval, which is the default. So with the 0.95 probability, we can predict that the city miles per gallon, I'm sorry, the highway miles per gallon for a city miles per gallon of 25 would be between 27.9 and 34, well, let's say 35. So if we wanted to make another prediction, uh, let's say we want to predict uh, uh, 32. Well, I would go data frame MPG city equals 32 and predict model predict 32 and let's do interval equal predict. So guys we would predict uh, the highway miles per gallon for a car that has city miles per gallon of 32 to be around 38, 37.7 with the 95% confidence interval between 34 and 41. All right, gang, uh, that's that's all I want to do there. I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. I wanted to show you again, and I know we've done it before, but I wanted to just remind you that we have this library mass. And with the data uh, open parentheses, well, parentheses with nothing in there, we can get a list of the data. I chose Cars 93 just because, uh, um, <laughs> just because I did. Uh, always come in with names because otherwise you have no earthly idea what the variables are called. 
And again, make sure you attach these things because if you start trying to find the mean, um, uh, it's it's not going to uh, do any calculations on the on the variables until you attach it. And furthermore, remember, unlike your professor right now, that standard deviation is SD and not STDEV. So, um, all right. So, uh, so gang, let's go for it. Uh, let's go back to the chalkboard and get into inference using uh, the F statistic. All right, gang. Um, first of all, to to uh, let's let's just recall that um, that F is the mean square for the regression over the mean square error and I have told you and guys again Chris you brought this up just what is the difference between the F statistic and the F critical well this is called an F statistic and our F statistic follows the F distribution with degrees uh, uh, well, degrees of freedom for the mean square regression, which is 1, and the mean square error, which is n minus 2. Now, for us to be able to make an inference on R, Goodness gracious! For us to to me to be able to make an inference uh, uh, on f, uh, we need to examine the expected value. Of f, and I think that's uh, pretty obvious because uh, <laughs> you know, in a nutshell, we need to know just what is being estimated. Now we take these things for uh, granted when we, you know, looking at the sample mean mu, uh, and you know, corresponding x bar, we kind of take it for granted now in terms of beta zero and beta one. But you know, again, what's the expected value of f? Exactly what's being estimated here? So uh, let's, um, you know, take a look at this. Well, one thing that we know from previous. Uh, lectures is that the expected value of the mean square error is going to be nothing more than the variance. And I will tell you now that the expected value of the mean square for regression is going to be sigma square plus beta 1 squared times the sum from i equal 1 to n of x sub i minus x bar quantity squared. Now, uh, you know, you don't have to have a PhD in uh, statistics or mathematics to see that, um, uh, to, well, to, let's think this through. Ultimately, what we're doing, we're setting the stage to be able to conduct the inference. And we're going to want to examine, you know, in the simple linear regression case where we have one predictor variable, and I told you in previous videos that we really don't care that much about beta zero. All the emphasis is on the slope, beta one. So we're ultimately going to want to carry out the comparison uh, of the Nolan alternative where beta one is equal to zero versus not equal to zero. Now, <clears throat> guys, when, uh, when the null holds true, when beta 1 is equal to 0, then it's easy to see when we put that in here and square it that this whole term right here becomes 0. So when beta 1 is equal to 0, let me actually, I think I'd rather do that over here. Beta 1 
then we get um, the expected value for the mean square regression is the same as the mean square for the error because this will create sigma squared equals sigma squared. Okay. Now, when beta 1 is not equal to 0, what happens? Well, it's really clear that um, that uh, when examining sigma squared versus sigma squared plus this, and again, uh, we have the expected value for the mean square error. And this is the expected value for mean square regression. Fingers getting tired holding this, this iPad, okay? So, uh, guys, when uh, beta 1 is not 0, it follows. <clears throat> you know, again, whether it's positive or negative, uh, when we square something here, we're going to get a positive number. And obviously, the sum of positive numbers, which has to be because we're squaring. So ultimately, what we get when B1 is not equal to 0 is we get that the expected uh, value of the mean square regression has to be bigger than the expected value for the mean square error. Now, I don't know if it um, if this is going to really make sense to you, but since since we you know have proven very simply that the mean square or expected error uh, expected value for the mean square regression has to be bigger than the uh, expected value for the mean square error, that um, you know we may need to to investigate. the relationship between the expected value for the mean square regression and the expected value for the mean square error. More specifically, it's to our advantage to investigate the ratio of the expected value mean square regression over the mean square error. Now again, if this number up here is bigger and as it gets more and more, uh, as it gets larger, uh, then we get a ratio that gets larger. Um, and uh, you know, we know in sampling distributions that our test statistic gets lar larger, our p-value goes down, more evidence gets the null hypothesis. And, uh, <clears throat> So it turns out that uh, this ratio right here is very useful in conducting uh, inferential statistics using the ANOVA table and the F statistic. So guys, let's carry it out. So what we'd want to do is we would want to carry out uh, H sub O beta 1 equals 0 versus H sub A beta 1 not equal to 0 and let's just take, carry it out carry it out at point zero 0.05 now we know our f statistic is the mean square regression over the mean square error and we know this follows the F distribution. 
degrees of freedom, 1 comma n minus 2. We know that because, you know, I've told you that. But, you know, it's a graduate level class and we need to investigate things uh, much more closely. So, you know, how do we know? that our sampling distribution is the F distribution. with degrees of freedom one uh, and n minus two. How do we know that? Well guys there's a theorem and I think it's called uh, the Cochrane theorem but uh, honestly I don't remember and uh, so don't hold me to this, but the theorem goes something like this. Um, it, it says that uh, if, hmm, now let me think this one through. If we have, um, in, measures and let's just call those y sub i that come from uh, well the kids are home so <laughs> it's getting ready to get crazy they come from um, the same normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. All right, hold on, guys. Okay, uh, make sure I'm back here. Okay, so um, I lost my train of thought. Did you have fun? Okay. All right, so we, uh, let me, oh, good goodness, okay. So we have n measures, y sub i, that come from the same normal distribution with mean mu and a variance sigma squared. And... Our total sum of squares can be partitioned into K groups. Um, oh, well, let's go, I'll tell you what, let's do this, case sums. Um, that's sum of squares. And obviously each with their own degrees of freedom. And then 
h sum of square as that the sum of square divided by sigma squared <laughs> hard for me to concentrate imagine why okay guys I'm losing my place here sum of squares can be partitioned into k groups or sums the sum of squares each with their own degrees of freedom then each sum of squares which we'll investigate as the sum of square divided by the variance. Okay, I'm back with you now. Are independent. I squared variables. With degrees of freedom. being the sum of the degrees of freedom, think for, for all the sum of squares, if you will, have to be equal to n minus 1. Now, I'm pretty sure, and I don't remember exactly, but look me up on this. I'm probably spelling it incorrectly, but I think this is called Cochrane's theorem. Or it could be Cochrane. I don't, I'm not really sure, but let's uh, um, let's let's go with that. Now, guys, what we got here uh, clearly applies, right? Um, because, um, and I'm going to go in here and change to a big old red. Now I read it's too much like Ohio State and uh, uh, Louisville. So let's go to you know good old fashioned blue pen. All right, so let's go back to this. So if we have n measures that come from the same normal distribution, uh, well, darn it, blue didn't show up. So let's uh, let's go yellow. All right. So a no same normal distribution, uh, same mean and variance, and that's all cool. And our total sum of squares can be partitioned into two sums, namely what? Well, sum of squares for the regression and sum of squares for the error. Each with their own degrees of freedom. Well, clearly it is. Sum of squares uh, for regression has degrees of freedom 1, and sum of squares for error has degrees of freedom n minus 2. So each of these sum of squares, each of these, can be viewed as the sum of squares for the regression divided by sigma squared and the sum of squares for the, I'm sorry, regression. Yeah, regression. And the sum of squares for the uh, error divided by sigma squared are independent chi-square variables with a sum of our degrees of freedom be equal to n minus 1. Well, this works out nicely because we know that the degrees of freedom for the sum of squares for total is equal to n minus 1. So the Cochrane, well, I don't want to say Cochrane because I'm not sure. But the, uh, the theorem that uh, I have here applies. Uh, so the end result is, I'll tell you what, guys, give me, give me one minute and I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. I may have been more in a minute, but uh, had to take care of some stuff. 
All right, so guys, so at the end of the day, what we're saying is, uh, again, the k is equal to 2 because we have sum of squares regression and sum of squares error. So what we can say is that the sum of squares for the regression over sigma squared and the sum of squares for the error over sigma squared uh, are chi squared variables. Okay? I kind of like the yellow pen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's go back to white. Okay, now what this allows us to do is examine more closely uh, our F statistic. Which we can now see as being uh, sum of squares regression over sigma squared over its degrees of freedom. Divided by sum of squares for the air, and you probably see what's going to happen. Our sigma squares are going to cancel out. Which ultimately, um, uh, this would just give us on top the uh, sum of squares. Regression over sigma squared, and down here we're going to get the sum of squares for the error over n minus 2 sigma squared. <clears throat> and ultimately, guys, we're going to get into a situation where. Um, uh, let's see, invert and multiply, so, well, yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, this, this is just pretty simple arithmetic here. Uh, we ultimately get into a situation where the F statistic uh, is um, equal to the mean square regression divided by the mean square error. And, you know, I, I left dot, dot, dot here. Uh, go ahead and see if you can, um, can can handle this. I'm sure you can. What ultimately happens is you're probably going to know is these things uh, cancel out and you get uh, uh, exactly what we get, the mean square regression divided by mean square error. So what we can determine there is when uh, B1 is equal to 0, um, F is a random variable. And with degrees of freedom, 1 in minus 2. Now, <laughs> here's a tricky part, and i, I got to admit, I don't even know if I could explain this. I'm not prepared to explain it here. When beta 1 is not equal to 0, we actually get something that's not the F distribution. It actually gets into what's called a non-central F distribution, um, and I encourage you to look this up if it's something that interests you. Um, I'm not going to cover it because, um, but um, nevertheless, we can make calculations. Um, you know, again, let's think of the logic behind uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, we're calculating the probability, the p-value, under the assumption that b1 is equal to zero. And um, so we're making our calculations that way, but uh, this this gets really tricky right here when beta one is not equal to zero. So um, uh, look it up. Uh, that that's that's all I'm gonna say about that. To be honest with you, I'm not prepared to, and it may take me a month to figure that one out. Cause I remember it was very 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 complicated. So guys, uh, let's let's talk about our decision criterion. Remember, first thing we do is calculate the F statistic. 
And remember, this is going to be equal to the mean square regression divided by the mean square error. The second thing we do is we decide which uh, decision criterion we want to use, whether we want to use the F critical. or if we want to use the p-value approach. So I want to illustrate this uh, in R. So let's just say that we get an F statistic equal to 2.5. And we want to look at the F critical and the p-value uh, in the F distribution with degree, uh, you know, whatever, 150. So again, our F statistic equals 2.5. Now I'm going to go to R to make these, uh, this, this calculation. So uh, first thing I'd want to do is um, let's let's calculate uh, the p-value. So there I would go p-f. I think f is all I have to do. And uh, I would want to go 2.5 uh, degrees of freedom 1 comma 50. And since that's going to give me the upper tail probability, I've got to go 1 minus that. And we can see that our p-value here is 0.12, which would, uh, uh, you know, not be greater than 0.05, so we would fail to reject. Now the f critical value, we would use uh, qf, and since we're working at a probability, uh, well, a type one error rate of point, well, alpha level 0.05 and we're conducting a right tail, one tail test, which is customary in the F distribution, we need to have 0.95 to the left of that with degrees of freedom 1 comma 50. So the line in the sand would be 4.03431 in terms of our F statistics. So if our F statistic was bigger than 4.0341, 4.03431, let me slow down a little bit here, I'm trying to get finished because the girls are home. Uh, then we would have statistical significance, meaning our p-value would be less than, uh, than 0.05. And you can illustrate this. For example, if we take 1 minus uh, p-f, and let's go just, uh, let's get sneaky. Let's go 4.03432. All right, you see what I did. I went 1, um, well, just a little bit. Uh, bigger than the than the cutoff here. So right here the cutoff the line in the sand for statistical significance is this. I added one uh, what is that? Tenths, hundredths, thousand, ten thousand, one hundred thousandths. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get something just a slightly bit uh, less than 0.05 which technically would give uh, a statistical significance. So uh, so guys, you know, the decision criterion is really, really simple um, to, to, to do. Uh, and you'll, find, you'll see, you know, when you do some of these by hand that the, uh, the calculation of the sum of squares are actually very easy with just a raw data set. Um, final thing I want to, to do here, um, I think, let me see if I've even got time to do that in this video. Ah, yeah. Let's let's go ahead and pop it out here. Take it. It'll take about five minutes. Um, notice that uh, when we've tested versus not equal to zero, we've actually done two things. Okay. One time we ran a t-test. And now I'm just confusing things by conducting uh, an ANOVA and running an F-test. Now again, if we go back to, um, to R, uh, I think we did that earlier. Notice that uh, our 
for our t test, which was conducted right here, obviously, because we have a t value. Uh, notice that, uh, and I'm going to write this stuff down, uh, we had a estimate of point nine zero, so that was our beta 1, and we had a standard error of point oh three three. And we had a T value equal to 27.28. All right, just to complicate your lives, <laughs> not really. Uh, you can see that when we ran the ANOVA, we had an F statistic of 743. Point ninety-eight. Now, under our degrees of freedom here of 1 and 91, let's just see how statistically significant. I know that's kind of like you know, pregnant, not pregnant, but uh, let's see how statistically significant we are because for degrees of freedom 191, if we do QF, 0.95, 191, you can see that the line in the sand is an F uh, critical of 3.94. We get an F statistic of 743.98, which is a lot bigger. So we, uh, uh, I would say, you know, in this case, we have strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So strong evidence against the null hypothesis in both situations. Uh, remember this high T value created the low P value. I pointed out earlier that this F P value, the, the P value for the F statistic, the p-value for the t-statistic were the same. So guys, right now we have strong evidence against the null hypothesis indicating that the slope of the regression model, which is used to predict city highway miles per gallon from, I'm sorry, to predict highway miles per gallon from city miles per gallon is statistically significant. All right, so let's get into that. Um, it turns out that at... Uh, alpha level given that we have an F test is equivalent to a two tail T test. Now Inquiring minds want to know. Well, guys, I pointed this subtle fact out uh, to you um, a few videos back. And it's going to play a pretty critical role in this. Okay? So, guys, we know uh, that uh, the F statistic. And we expressed as the mean square regression over the mean square error, which can be rewritten as the sum of squares for regression over 1 over the sum of squares for error over m minus 2. Now, from this fact, we see the sum of squares regression can be rewritten as this. Better hurry up, I've only got 5% charge left <laughs> over the mean square error. Now, we saw in an earlier video that the variance of B1 was equal to the mean square error divided by uh, the sum of 
x sub i minus x bar quantity squared. So guys, no surprise here. The mean square error is going to be the variance v1 times the sum x sub i minus x bar quantity squared. Now, making some uh, simple substitutions here. Uh, we can see, therefore, that when we go back here and go mean square error, and we make this substitution, with this term. These cancel. And we are left with B1 uh, squared divided by the standard error squared of B1. I think that's right. Yeah. Which, if you think about this, what is this? Just T squared. Because you guys remember T is beta 1. My, I'm sorry, B1 minus beta 1 over the standard error for B1. We are assuming uh, no hypothesis, beta 1 is equal to 0. So guys, if we square both sides, you can see that we have precisely t squared. Now, this is kind of cool because if we go back and look at our ANOVA, well, no, we don't need to go back and look at the ANOVA. Let's look at, the, um, uh, let's look at what we have right here. Uh, we can see that... Um, I wrote these down for a reason because I knew this was coming. Um, so if we take um, uh, our t value of 27.28 and uh, square that, uh, you know, appreciating the fact that we have some rounding error, we notice that uh, t squared is equal to f. All right, guys, about run, ready to run out of juice, both uh, literally and figuratively. So this is at the end of the video. Talk to you later. See ya.